Thank you for that nice introduction, Vicki. Um, I'm going to talk about water and talk about power plants uh, as they relate to the, the Missouri River. Well, as probably all you know, the, the lower Missouri River runs from Gavin's Point Dam down to the Mississippi River, and it's got uh, a lot of beneficial uses. Um, it's aquatic life support, uh, of course, is a main one. There's recreation, like your, like your uh, 340 mile river race. Uh, there's also commercial navigation uh, supported on this river. And it's also um, a water supply for um, municipal, municipalities and uh, industry, industries. But the largest withdrawer of water uh, from the Missouri River are electric power generating facilities. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So there are lots of power plants on the lower Missouri River. Um, and I'm going to talk about why, a little bit about why they use so much water, what are some of the regulations affecting their, the, their intakes and their um, dish withdrawals, and um, how the changing river is affecting these power plants, and to some extent, uh, how the power plants do or don't affect the river. Well, to start with, uh, these are the power plants um, on the Missouri River. They start at Sioux City, Iowa, and go almost uh, all the way down um, uh, to St. Louis. And uh, the most concentrated area is right here in Kansas City, where there are actually three between uh, Kansas City, Kansas, and, and Kansas City, Missouri proper. So there are 14 active power plants. They range in size from relatively small, 46 megawatts, up to gigantic, uh, 2,000, almost 400 megawatt plants. Uh, 10 of these are coal-fueled units. One of them uh, was a coal fuel unit and was recently converted to natural gas. And three of them use uranium. In other words, they're, they're uh, nuclear power plants. The one thing they have in common, though, is that they're all called steam electric power plants. And what does that mean? Well, this is a brief, very brief primer on what a steam electric cycle is. Um, you burn fuel, uh, boil water in a boiler, and make steam. That's pretty much uh, 18th century technology. Um, the steam then turns a turbine, which is connected to a generator, which produces electricity. Now, after the steam has done its thing in the generator, um, there still has um, some excess heat in it. And this heat needs to be removed. And it's done so in a condenser, uh, where the steam gets turned back into water. Um, and that heat, where the heat is removed. Um, it has the additional advantage of when, this, when the steam goes from a gas and turns back into water, its volume contracts considerably, and it actually helps uh, create sort of a vacuum that actually helps pull steam through the turbine as well as getting pushed. Um, so when the water gets, steam gets turned back into water, then the water goes back to the boiler, and round and round it goes. <clears throat> So there's two ways you can remove that remaining heat from the steam. And the easiest way is to pull water out of a river, like the Missouri River, uh, transfer that heat from the steam into that water, and then put the water back into the river. Now, of course, the water is now has, has absorbed some heat, and it, so its temperature has, has risen. A slightly less easier way is to use a recirculating condenser cooling water system um, where you, the, the water that goes through the condenser just goes around in a circle, but it, it, that water passes through an evaporative cooling tower. And basically, this allows, through evaporation, to transfer the excess heat, comes out of the steam, goes into the cooling water, and then goes, ends up through, via the cooling tower it goes up uh, into the atmosphere. Now there's um, some water involved in this. It gets pulled out of the river. It gets sprayed down through the cooling tower. A lot of it gets evaporated. And you have to pull in some extra water to keep the, the total dissolved solids from concentrating. And you, and you have to discharge some of that water constantly, sort of a continuous flushing process. <clears throat> 
But there are advantages and disadvantages to each one of these systems. The once-through system, we call it, as it's called, is really more efficient. Whereas the closed cycle system, it takes a lot of energy to, to run some of these extra pumps and to especially to run the fans that help move air through the, the cooling tower. And the cooling towers themselves are kind of expensive. Um, and you, the cooling towers don't really do as good a job as cooling off the steam. So there's a, an energy penalty and a parasitic load from cooling towers that for an equivalent size plant would reduce your overall net generation, the amount of electricity you could put out on the grid, somewhere by three to five percent. So there's a cost associated with that. Now the good thing about the good things another good thing about once through cooling is that all the water you take out of the river basically gets turned around and put back in. And you know, um, but with a closed cycle system, about 75 to 90 percent of the water that is removed actually gets evaporated. So there's a significant uh, consumptive use. On the downside, once through cooling not only pulls in a lot of water, but it can also pull in a lot of organisms along with it. And, and by a lot of water, we mean roughly for every megawatt that a power plant has, it pull, will pull in roughly, this is very rough, about one million gallons per day of water. So if you have a 100 megawatt power plant, it's going to have an intake rate of roughly 100 million gallons per day. And that's a lot of water. So that's why power plants are the big dogs in terms of water withdrawal. Now, closed cycle cooling with the cooling towers uses a lot less water, like 95% less, because it's just going in to replace the water that's evaporating and maintaining the salinity in the cooling towers. Now, relatively speaking, a once-through plant is, a, you know, you know, that's sort of the baseline. You know, it's not, you know, if there's an amount of air pollution that's going to be generated, that, this is the baseline. Um, now, a closed cycle plant, however, actually will cause, generate a little more air pollution um, because the water vapor itself that comes out of the cooling towers actually has a lot of, when it finally, all that water evaporates, what's left is a lot of very fine particulate matter that used to be dissolved in the water but no longer is. So there's a, uh, you know, so there's a, this particulate matter, air pollution from a cooling tower, and also, you know, if you want to maintain the same amount of net generation, they're going to have to burn a little more fuel in order to get the same amount of power out of the power plant. So, of these 14 power plants that are associated with Missouri, 13 of them use once through cooling. The exception is uh, the Callaway facility uh, in there in central Missouri. It's got a, it has a great big, uh, as you can see in this picture, a great big hyperbolic cooling tower. Well, here's a typical intake, uh, what we call a cooling water intake structure for a once through cooling uh, cooled facility. Uh, this happens to be the one at, for uh, the Nearman Creek plant on the Missouri River near, cross, sort of across the river from Parkville. You can see that it's located on the riverbank. And when you look at what's sort of the interior, you find that out, you know, right outside of the river, there's these big trash racks. These keep out the logs uh, and the big stuff, you know, maybe a body here or there, who knows. And, um, and then behind those trash racks, there's another set of screens. These are usually called uh, traveling screens because they travel. And they have a, a mesh that's usually about three-eighths of an inch. And these are designed to keep the smaller stuff out and the fish and stuff like that. Um, and then behind that are the actual pumps. And um, the tra traveling screens are important um, because you don't want this, you don't want big stuff going in through your water system because there are lots of tiny spaces in the condenser and you don't want that to get plugged up. So that's why it's important to to sort of filter the water before it, as it goes into the power plant. And then finally, yes, there are the big pumps. Um, they're not sort of like the sump pump you have in your basement. Um, they have motors that sit up here on the, on the top right here. And the pump is actually a propeller 
that sits down in here and this motor spins a propeller and it pulls the water up and through. Now I'm gonna draw a little bit on traveling screens um, because um, they're kind of getting a lot of attention these days in the uh, utility world. Um, they're like a vertical conveyor belt. Um, water flows in through the front, right here, and then out through the back. Um, and they can be rotated um, around a big cog or gears. Um, so that and what happens is the debris that gets caught on the front of the screens is rotated up and out of the water. And then there are these high pressure sprays across the top that basically back flush or backwash the screens to get the debris. Um, that spray water and the debris then goes into a trough, and in most cases, it goes back into the river. Now, there is a section of the Clean Water Act. It's called Section 316B, and it's been around since the Clean Water Act has been around, which is, I believe, 1970-something, and it requires cooling water intakes to use the best technology available to minimize the adverse impacts to aquatic environment. And what adverse impact has really come to mean over the years is mortality of aquatic organisms. And this can happen in, in two ways. There is an impingement and entrainment. Um, impingement is when organisms get um, trapped on the traveling screens, in this case, by the force of the water that flows through them. Uh, entrainment is where you have these small early life stages of eggs and larvae um, of aquatic organisms that actually pass through the screens because they're really tiny and, uh, and then through the cooling system. And, and both of these um, activities are not necessarily in the, you know, in the aquatic organism's best interest. Now, Previously, versions of the 316B study, and there have been at least three, um, because it's a, been a long, tortured story of regulations get proposed, regulations get challenged in court, regulations get tossed out. And that's happened at least twice, and we're sort of on the third version now of some of this stuff. Um, but these regulations, in the last go-around, required plants with once through cooling uh, to conduct impingement characterization studies to find out um, you know, how much, what kind of fish and how many they were actually impinging. And um, I have been involved with five of those, such of those studies here on the Missouri River that were done in the mid to late uh, 2000s. These studies lasted a year. Um, so every other week we go out there and collect all the fish that were coming off the traveling skis for 24 hours. And we found uh, up and down the Missouri River and, an, and a number of other rivers like the Mississippi as well, that almost 90% of the fish that we got were gizzard shad. And if you know what the gizzard shad is, it's a, it's a herring. It um, is pretty much a filter feeder. It's a very popular prey fish for, um, for other uh, fish in the, in the rivers and in lakes. And we found that we get the big spike of these guys in the winter. And it turned out that uh, what's happening with these gizzard shad is that they are not very cold tolerant. And in the winter, they get stressed out. Um, and a lot of them will just perish. Um, and a lot of them will just go into a stupor. And they get very pulled in sometimes in great quantities into the power plants. But fortunately, um, they're also gizzard shad are are very fecund and reproduce very rapidly. So I thought I'd just touch on a few of um, my impingement gallery, so to speak, of some of the more interesting fish that we've got uh, caught over the years. Um, the first one here is a shovel-nosed sturgeon, um, very iconic fish for the Missouri River. You know, one of the you know, ancient fish, they compare it to a dinosaur because it's been around, the sturgeons have been around for that long. And then there's its more illustrious and probably well-known cousin, the, or I should say sister species, the pallid sturgeon. Um, and this one uh, was caught at a power plant, impinged in a power plant in, in uh, Iowa. 
And you'll notice we have circled here, it says pit tag location. That's because any pallet sturgeon you find in the river that's of this size, and this guy's only a couple of feet long, were, have been stocked by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They've been raised in a hatchery and uh, put into the river. And they, each one of them gets a pit tag installed in it for identification, as well as some few other markers. And this pit tag is the same kind of thing, exactly the same kind of tag that you would put in your dog or your cat. And in fact, we had to go out and get one of those readers so that we could scan these fish and report uh, the information back to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. One of the sort of the um, it was very interesting when we when we got these fish and we and the Fish and Wildlife Service seemed to be kind of delighted to know what was happening to the fish that they had reared and, and stocked in the river. And, and they also came to the realization that, you know, maybe we shouldn't stock these fish into the river a mile upstream of a power plant because, you know, they just get, you know, it's really easy for this new fish that got stocked to get uh, in, sucked into the power plant. We had one poor pallet sturgeon um, who got pulled into one plant and he was, he didn't look too great and we put him back in the river and the next day we got him at the a power plant a mile downstream. I'm afraid he didn't make it that time. <clears throat> it was a bad day for him. Now, here's, an, here's some esoterica, uh, impingement gallery factoid. How to tell the difference between a pallid and a shovel-nosed sturgeon. Well, you gotta turn them over and you look at their barbels. If they're arranged in a chevron fashion, like here, shown here with that blue chevron, that's a pallid. If they're straight across, that's a shovel nose. Another iconic fish that we've collected uh, from the Missouri River that's been in, impinged is, a, is the paddlefish. Um, fortunately, we don't, you know, we're not gonna get the huge ones. This one's actually relatively small. And fortunately, unlike, the, uh, they're not uh, endangered on the endangered species, less like the pallet is. Here's another weird fish that most people don't probably recognize. It's called a gold eye, and it's got a cousin called a moon eye. Um, they're a weird kind of fish. They're not quite a herring, um, but they're kind of um, unusual looking. Uh, they have, uh, you might notice on this one, some of the scales are a little bit damaged in this area, and that possibly from the high pressure wash that uh, knocked this guy off the traveling screens. Um, another more run-of-the-mill fish, white sucker. We get all kinds. Um, again, he's looking. There's, there's some more, some more damage, perhaps, from the high-pressure sprays. We think that's the most injurious part of these uh, traveling screens is when they get hit with this spray that's like 100 pounds per square inch. Here's a, another interesting critter. This one I think is on uh, the on some of the state endangered species. This is called a chestnut lamprey. Very primitive uh, fish. Doesn't really have a real mouth. Just got a sucker here. And here's the, here's the cool thing. This guy got kind of chewed up a little bit on his way to our bin. This is this purple stuff right here. That's actually its blood. They have purple blood. And one more. A species that's usually pretty rare. Looks like a regular old minnow, but it's actually called a, sil it's a silver chub. I think it's threatened in Kansas, for instance. Um, the only way you can tell, really, it's a chub. It's this little tiny thing sticking down off the corner of its mouth, and sometimes that's really hard to see. This one was actually been, he looks kind of bad because he was actually preserved before we were able to identify it. <laughs> So now, with the, there are new regulations um, enforcing 316B, and they're going to require some of these larger ones through power plants to conduct um, entrainment characterization studies. Uh, these are supposed to last for two years uh, of sampling. Um, there haven't been any done on the Missouri River yet, because in the, under the previous rules, um, certain power plants on big rivers didn't have to do that. But now it's a new requirement, um, and I expect to be doing some of these uh, next year, in fact, <clears throat> on at least a couple of power plants here in, on the Missouri River. Now, 
sort of typically we have found the annual impingement of, of the fish on the Missouri River can range anywhere from one to 10,000 a year. And that may sound like a lot, but then again, most of them are this very reproductively blessed gizzard shad um, that were dead or dying from cold stress on there when they got impinged anyway. One of the things we believe that keeps a lot of fish out of cooling water intakes is the, is the high velocity of the flow in the river itself, where the water flowing past the front of a cooling water intake can be going maybe three feet per second, which is actually faster than the water being drawn into the intake. So fish are more likely to get swept past the intake than necessarily get pulled into it. And the other thing is a lot of they, these intakes aren't usually just located anywhere willy-nilly uh, on the river. They're usually sited on an outside bend where the, where the river has carved the deepest channel, the shoreline is steepest, and that's where the flow is really the greatest. Um, and that, again, that's this areas of high velocity is not where fish like to hang out. And they don't want to waste their energy trying to fight the current. They're more likely to go someplace else where there's a... Um, the, the flow is not so hard and they don't have to, to fight to stay in one spot. Now, based on a lot of other studies that have been done across the country you know, in freshwater systems, the entrainment of fish eggs and larvae is probably on the order of a thousand times greater than the entrainment, just because there are just lots more fish and you know, eggs and larvae out there. Now, but we got to remember <clears throat> that it's, we're learning more and more these days that roughly half of impinged and even entrained fish, these are the little, little eggs and larvae that go through the pumps, go through the condenser, get exposed to a 10 to 20 degree Fahrenheit rise in a matter of seconds, about 50% of them actually <laughs> survive. So it's not a, not a total wipeout. And the other thing is that naturally, even without the power plants, only about one in a thousand of these eggs or larvae will actually survive to be a one-year-old fish. So um, <clears throat> you see in some of the environmental, I hate to use the word propaganda, but it almost comes across like that. You see these very large numbers thrown around about how, how many or fish that these power plants are killing, you know, in the billions. Well, I think most of that is probably actually eggs and larvae um, that are being counted as equivalent to an adult fish. And let's put it, face it, there are some places where impingement and entrainment is a real problem, but it's, uh, but it's not usually in freshwater rivers like the Missouri, the Mississippi, the Ohio. It's in estuarine situations that you find uh, in coastal uh, areas where you have these estuaries that are you know, tremendous uh, nursery and spawning areas for very valuable commercial fisheries. Well, the new rules require that power plants uh, install um, a new fish-friendly technology that just to reduce um, impingement mortality. Um, and these can be a, um, a traveling screen that's got um, special sprays and, and buckets to transfer fish uh, more gently out of the water, keep them in the water, return them nicely to the river instead of maybe dumping them on the shoreline, which happens sometimes. Um, or you got, or you can have a, um, a different type of screen or an intake structure that's really very large and, and the through screen velocity, the amount of the force going through the screen is like very low, you know, less than half a foot per second. And EPA has determined that almost all fish could swim away from this low velocity. So that's, that's one, one of the other ways to do it. Uh, the new rules give a variety of choices, but those are probably the most common that we're going to see. Um, but the, the other w way to handle entrainment, though, is to convert to closed cycle cooling. You know, you got to go from once through, put in some cooling towers, and this is sort of the gold standard for reducing entrainment, because now you have actually minimized the amount of water that you're withdrawing, 
And because these eggs and larvae have next to no locomotory capacity, you, they're, you know, they're just like particles in the water, the less water you withdraw, the less of these other organisms you will with, with entrain as well. Um, the, there is a secondary option uh, to install some sort of fine mesh screens uh, on your intake structure. Like I said earlier, the typical mesh size on a uh, traveling screen is 3 eighths of an inch. But um, you can go you know, less than that. Um, the, uh, the definition of fine mesh is 2 millimeters or less. And I've heard of some places where they've actually gone to half a millimeter mesh screens in order to keep eggs and larvae uh, out of power plants. Ultimately, though, the Supreme Court weighed in on a ruling and, uh, and allows um, the owners of utilities to decide, you know, that it may, in some of these uh, entrainment reduction things, it may not be cost effective. In other words, the cost of, say, retrofitting your plant with cooling towers may not be commensurate with the benefit. And, and the rules have left this up to basically the states who were administer the, um, this program to decide um, what is the best technology for a plant to um, must use to reduce entrainment? And it boils down to a cost-benefit analysis. So, so that's the uh, sort of the summary here. Um, so, on the Lower Missouri River, um, my sort of conclusion is that power plants are not the fish-killing monsters that they have been portrayed in. in uh, by this, in this case, the Sierra Club. And I hate to say that because I am actually a life member of the Sierra Club. So <laughs> um, I, th um, I always get a little disturbed uh, when I see organizations that are supposed to be basing their, their, um, you know, their responses on science. And as a scientist, I obviously want to base my, my conclusions on science. Um, so when you get sort of this emotional kind of stuff going on, it's sort of, bothers me a little bit. All right, let's talk about the other side of the equation. This is what happens when, you know, after the water's gone through the condenser and it's going back to the river. It's uh, the heat that's added to that water is actually considered a pollutant. And it is regulated uh, as such. And there are water quality criteria. And a criteria is basically a number, you know, it's uh, most, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's a target to shoot for yeah, um, that, um, you know, that if, it's, if you meet this criteria, you're protecting the uses of that water body. So in all the states on the Missouri River, that's Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, and Missouri, there are basically two water quality criteria. First, the, the, the temperature of the receiving stream, in this case the Missouri River, cannot be raised more than five degrees Fahrenheit above ambient. And there's a limit that you, you, know, you can't go, and the second one is you can't go above 90 degrees Fahrenheit um, with a, as the maximum. So if your water temperature is 70 degrees, you can raise it up to 75. If your water temperature is 88, you can only go up to 90. And that'll, we'll talk a little more about that. Now, this, these limits don't apply at the end of the pipe. They apply at the edge of something called a mixing zone. And I'll explain what that is here. It is an area of the river or a proportion of the flow of the river um, that is allotted for the assimilation of pollutants. So, it, so if you've heard dilution is the solution to pollution, this is it. Mixing zone sort of personifies that, um, that little slogan. <clears throat> so because so, within the mixing zone, you're actually allowed to exceed some water quality criteria. You can be warmer than five degrees above ambient. You can be above 90 degrees, but by the time you get to the edge of this zone, you're supposed to be back to the water quality standards or criteria 
Now, the proportion of the flow that is used almost universally in, um, in determining what size of a mixing zone is, is 25% of something called a 7Q10. And that is, it's the seven day average low flow with a recurrence interval of once in 10 years. So that's one week out of 520 weeks. So it's a pretty rare event. It's a fairly low flow. It's not the lowest that you can get in a river, but it is, it is pretty close. And that is the flow down to which water quality criteria apply. A lot of times states, if the flow gets lower than that, water quality criteria are waived. Um, and I think part of the feeling is that that's not going to happen very often, or, nor will it happen for very long. So um, they allow for a waiver under those low flow conditions. And it is what the, it is a basis for how these, your agencies determine what the discharge limit for a facility would be. They, they figure if we, if we can decide, we can set a limit on, on how much heat your plant can discharge, and if it will meet the mixing zone requirements down at the 7Q10, it should obviously meet the limits at any greater flow. So now, there, you know, they define the limits um, or the proportion of flow. This 25% is a uh, is a real default position, but most of the state regulations also will define a mixing zone by its actual physical dimensions, um, length width uh, and or cross-sectional area are also ways that you can delimit the mixing zone in you know, three-dimensional space. Typically, um, they're allowed a width up to 50% of the river. It can be that wide. Um, but the cross-sectional area is pretty much limited to 25%, which is coincidentally that same proportion of the flow that is used. Um, the reason that it is uh, wider than you might think, than the cross-sectional area would indicate is because thermal plumes in particular tend to float. And they will float over the surface and then they will come back towards the shoreline. And that's shown a little bit here. And this is an actual cross-section, although not from the Missouri River, um, of a thermal plume. You can see here it sort of extends out into the river uh, more above the, um, uh, the along the surface. And the idea of limiting the width is, it, is to re, you know, create a zone of passage here so that organisms that are either floating or swimming up and down the river have a, can pass by this discharge without having to go through it. Um, <clears throat> now, the length of these mixing zones is actually varies considerably among the states. In Kansas, you're allowed only 300 meters, which is about 1,000 feet. In Iowa, it's 2,000 feet. In Nebraska, it can be up to 5,000 feet, which is darn near a mile. And in Missouri, there are no length limits for thermal discharges. So power plants get a pass on how long their discharge can be, provided that their discharge doesn't their mixing zone doesn't overlap another thermal mixing zone or a municipal water supply or a tributary mouth. So there are some restrictions. <clears throat> but you know, the point here is that it varies from state to state. Now, here's the problem with thermal. The river has been getting warmer. And I know one of our audience members is, knows more about that than I do, so I hope I don't insult his intelligence too much. Um, this is temperature data from Nebraska City, Missouri River at Nebraska City from a USGS uh, gauging station there. Um, it starts back in 1951, which is longer than I started, so that's, it's about 60 some five years worth of history here. And you can see the annual fluctuations, which you normally would expect. Um, the dark line across the top is the water quality criteria of 90 degrees, although this is in, in Celsius. 
But the more interesting thing is that, whoops, is this dashed line. This is the long-term trend line, and you can see that it's going up. And in fact, when you look at the, the spikes here, you can see a lot more of them are getting closer to that 90 degrees than there were back in this, at this time. And it looks like if you go from here to there, that's about a three and a half degree C rise, uh, centigrade rise over the, uh, over the 65 year period. Well, I will editorialize a little bit here. This is a, uh, I think an ironic problem. Uh, I think that the river t temperature increase is probably a result of the global warming that we've been experiencing over the past many years. And the ironic part is that global warming is caused in part by the fossil fuels that are burned by power plants. So um, in some respects, so some of the use of fossil fuels is coming back to, to be a little bit haunting. And the other object here is when the river temperature gets real close to this line, remember we said you can't go over that line, so that makes it much more difficult for power plants who are discharging heated water to comply with the water quality standards because they have very little room left to raise the temperature of the uh, water at the edge of the mixing zone. <clears throat> so in the last mm, seven, seven years or so, uh, states have been issuing new discharge permits that have, and a lot of them have had remarkably, in some cases, lower discharge temperature limits for these power plants. And frankly, some power plants have not been able, would not be able to meet the discharge limits that the state uh, was coming up with. And these were based on this very simple uh, dilution formula, 25% of the flow mixed with the flow from the river, you do a little weighted average calculation, you come up and you can back calculate what the discharge limit would be that would keep the combined mixing zone temperature under or at the water quality criteria. Well, this formula doesn't really take into account the actual dynamics uh, of a discharge plume or the fact that, you know, it's, it has length and it has, has width. So one of the things that we have been doing a, f a lot of for power plants is mixing zone studies. Um, and this is an alternative that can be used to the simple formulas that the state uses. And we do it by first going out to a power plant. We actually map the discharge plume uh, on the river. And we use a, a hydrodynamic discharge model to then determine what that plume looks like and, and where the edges of the mixing zone are at the 7Q10 flow. And the reason we have to use a model is because the 7Q10 flow only occurs like I said, one week out of 520. So the odds of us being able to go out in the river and actually measure uh, a plume at that flow is pretty low. So that's why we use modeling to extrapolate to this condition, which is very considered regulatorily important. So we have developed some techniques over the years for three-dimensional plume mapping, uh, where we measure Temperature versus depth. We developed a um, this is this is a data logger here, and uh, it basically has these wings on it that allow it to take advantage of the flow in the river when the boat is anchored to actually propel it up and down a cable which is anchored to the bottom of the river by a really heavy weight. Um, so this thing can fly up and down, and it records, we set it to record data about four times a second. So we get these very nice detailed uh, pictures of how temperature varies with depth in the river. And we measure, and we go out and measure these, what we call vertical profiles, at, at all kinds of, at, on transects, you can see where these dots are across the discharge plume. And we also make sure we go upstream too so we know what the background temperature is as well. And from that, we can that data we can generate sort of a plume map, sort of like a, you know, a contour map of temperature. And here's a couple of examples. 
Oops, again, this, uh, from up near Sioux City, Iowa. Here's a discharge coming out here, and you can see it's stretching down here. This blue here is just one degree centigrade above the ambient. So this one, so this plume here dissipates fairly quickly. This one's from uh, near Omaha, and, it and this one dissipates even faster, um, even though it's about the same size plant. And, um, and it's, but it's a function, in this case, of how that water is actually discharged into the river. It can be uh, important. Well, what do we do with the, with the plume map? Since it's not at any regulatorily important condition, well, we use it to calibrate our plume model. And we do this by looking at what is the temperature along the center line of the plume that we measured. And the center line is where is the hottest point in the plume for any given distance downstream of the outfall. So, and we find very typically that these discharge plumes will start out you know, hot at the, at the temperature of the discharge, drop very rapidly at first, and then level out. This is really common pattern. And, and we hope, and which happened here, is that we enter all the data from that day that we were out there doing the mapping. We enter that into our model. And lo and behold, we get a model output that measures puts out almost the exact same thing. So this is, a, this is a good result. Now that we have a calibrated model, <clears throat> we can then use it to determine what discharge limits might be the plant can have based on compliance with, say, in this case, mixing zone length as opposed to some arbitrary uh, flow rate. And we can find out at the low flow that the regulators are interested in. And we can look at either, we can either use the model uh, to find the maximum discharge temperature that will not cause the river to exceed the allowable mixing zone, or we can take, we can check it simply by looking, okay, this is the maximum discharge temperature of the power plant. Does that comply with the mixing zone? And so there's a couple different ways that we can um, run the model. But we do the model under worst case conditions. That's, uh, and it's done for each month because a lot of um, temperature changes each month. And the regulators will set limits by each month. So we look at the maximum river temperature. Um, we look at the minimum flow, which is that magic 7Q10. We look at the maximum power plant discharge rate. That's the volume of water that's going out and what that maximum temperature is. So we, so we try to you know, say, OK, this is the worst case scenario. If we comply at this case, then we should be comply at, at all the others. Well, what we found so far is that the power plants on the Missouri River can meet the temperature criteria at the ends of their allowable mixing zone. How much longer that's going to be continue the case if that water temperature keeps going up the way it has been? It looks like it's in the last few years it's it's plateaued out a bit. Um, that sort of remains to be seen. Now, one more item I want to talk about too that takes us out onto the river uh, is a river called river bottom degradation, and this is a result of the Missouri River being manipulated and channelized to support co uh, commercial navigation. All those wing walls you see, the Secor affectionately returns as training uh, structures uh, to train the river. Um, uh, those are all about the uh, keeping the river flowing in a, in a discrete channel. Um, all the bank stabilizations that also get done, all are part of this. And what they've done is narrowed the river considerably, as you probably know, by a lot, actually by a lot. Um, that's why it's increased the river's velocity, you know, the, and that's just definitely the reputation that the Missouri River has um, uh, as a very fast flowing river. And these devices along the shorelines have really uh, um, a prevented erosion along the shoreline. It's normally a river will change its course. You know, it meanders back and forth. It'll cut a bend and eventually it'll cut through it. Um, but that doesn't happen on the Missouri River. So all this fast-flowing water 
is the only place it has left to erode is on the bottom. And, and as a result, the river bottom elevation has is, is been dropping. And so now for the same flow, uh, you know, for 30,000 cubic feet, you know, 10, 10 or 20 years ago, we had a higher elevation than 30,000 cubic feet of uh, flow does today. The problem is with the power plants is that the, the cooling water intake structures aren't changing along with the, the, the bottom elevation of the river. Um, so, and they were, and so what elevation they were built for and designed to run at, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, um, those conditions have changed. And in some cases, at very low flows, they can't get enough water into the intakes to run their pumps. The, the, their submergence depth will be too low, and they'll draw water down and they'll end up sucking air which is really bad news if you need that water in a condenser. So it can cause a plant to shut down. So there have been several facilities on the lower Missouri River now that have installed what are uh, supplemental pumps. And this is, to me, this is kind of, it's really kind of Rube Goldberg. Um, they have these pumps hanging off the front of the intake structure. And when the river gets really low, they drop these things down into the water and, and pump water out of the river into the intake, which then pumps water up to the power plant. Um, they have, you know, they're not very well protected. As you can see, they just have these little screens around the outside. Um, and they're probably not, uh, not very fish friendly at all. So, um, but one of the things that we've been doing uh, oh, and there's one, ex one, ex one example, too, of what another power plant did. Um, they had supplemental pumps for a while, but they finally just broke down and they put in cooling towers for their plant, and those are right here. And they run them when the river is very low and their intake won't work on the river. So they, so they switch from once-through cooling, what we call closed-cycle cooling, in the winter. And when they're on closed cycle cooling, they're not using any river water at all. They're, getting a, they're actually getting the water that goes into the cooling towers is from a municipal water supply. So they don't use the river at all. But then when the river flows are higher, then they'll go back to once through cooling because that's much more efficient and economical for the power plant. Well, we've been tracking uh, river bed elevation for a for a couple of power plants um, by doing bathymetric mapping. We have a, a sonar unit and a, with a, uh, it's integrated with a global positioning system that's pretty darn accurate. And, and we can go out and run this system uh, across uh, the area we're interested in and collect all kinds of depth and location data. And we can run it through some computer programs and they will generate these bathymetric maps. And here's a, just an example of uh, a plant again from uh, Iowa. Here's, this is 2010 over here on the left. Here, this is 2011. And this was actually mapped during that big flood event that we had in 2011, if you can remember that back that far. Um, we actually, my crew had to get special dispensation from the Coast Guard to actually say it was okay for us to go out on the river because otherwise the Missouri River was closed at that time. Well, we can make these two maps and, be, and because it's all computer-based in a geographic information system, we can very easy, relatively easily come up with how that river bottom has changed between these two events. And you can see that from 2010 to 2011, there was quite a bit of scouring in some areas where it got deep, considerably deeper right here in front of the intake structures. And we've been doing that for several plants uh, on the Missouri River. So that's what I've been doing on the Missouri River um, these last oh, 15 years or so. Um, but, you know, my final sort of parting thoughts on this is that power plants on the lower Missouri River, they do discharge heat. They do impinge and entrain fish. There's no doubt about that. 
But these impacts are probably reasonably local. You know, the discharge plume is, you know, going to be limited to a this fairly discrete area around the power plant, um, you know, uh, you know, a few thousand feet. Um, and, and the fish that get impinged are, you know, are generally local as well. Um, obviously, they got impinged at one particular spot. So, but the river, the Missouri River has bigger systemic problems. There is this um, pointless flow manipulation to support essentially non-existent commercial navigation. There's a channelization that went around along with this that has wiped out important habitat. And now we have invasive species coming in um, that compete with the native species. So in the end, you never hear anyone saying, man, if we could just get rid of these power plants, that would take care of the problems on the Missouri River. That's not what, you don't hear that. Um, what you hear about are these other issues. So um, we'll see what the future holds in terms of the hoops that power plants have to jump through in these days. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, I, by the way, I, you can't talk about the Missouri River with having at least one flying cart picture in it. So I had to, I had to get that out of the way. No questions, please. <laughs>